Okay, we're back in session. Next phthalate for discussion is DNOP. Hoger, I think you wanted to lead the discussion on this one. I think from the toxicity side, we are more or less in the less critical range of the phthalates or DNOP and exposure wise detection rates and levels are very very low exposure wise Paul from your side is it an issue no it's not an issue We have to be aware that there's not too much toxicity data out there, but the data out there is uh, indicating that it seems to be outside of the window of activity. And even Talking about for re reproductive and developmental endpoints, yes. right? And in aggregate exposure all across the board, it's some liver and thyroid effects though and the one developmental toxicity study which was uh, done at the right gestational <coughs> stages mm -hmm. um, multiple doses that covered the dose range that typically for the active phthalates, if this was one, it would have shown an effect and there were no anti-androgenic effects. So um, again, one study, no anti-androgenic effects. Could we state that in the hazard section? That, uh, yeah. me to say no anti-androgenic effects in terms of, yeah. but in the developmental section doesn't it say the NTP CURHR concluded available studies suggest development toxicity response with Gavage very high doses up in um, 1b that was very uh, high doses, right? Yeah, it doesn't say what doses were, and that that was um, five old, older studies, and then yeah. silent fight. I don't know how to. Yeah, but those them. are those are not those are done um, at a at a stage in gestation, not relevant to inducing anti-androgenic effects. Okay. Uh, there's the supernumerary ribs in the recent paper by Salon Fair. Again, yeah, that, that's an effect, but not the one that we're most concerned about. So, I think we could say it like that. Yeah. Yes. That's why I, I specifically said the anti androgenic effects. Mike, one more. We we could start off, Mike, by saying although uh, DNOP 
P did produce Yeah, it's, yeah, skeletal variations. There was no evidence of one study. Mm -hmm. No, it was, it was a, it was a dose um, dependent, so. Uh, it was done at, it, it Effects at non maternally toxic doses. I don't think that's necessary. Now I think we should add, uh, well, I don't know about half. Under risk, I think we need to say something about. Um, presence in toys and child care products. And currently, currently it's not. Uh, exposure section part A there, the biomonitoring, or the margin of exposure part needs to, I think, be cut out because uh, that was an earlier version of what we looked at, but then we noted that the um, detection rate in NHANES was only about 1% of the population. So what do you want to say about exposure and C? There's really no exposure. There's no exposure. Yeah. I think we should th say that not just for toys, but also we, it's for the aggregate exposure. Yeah. Is yeah. Not, it's basically de minimis. The risk aggregate exposure to DNLP. Negligible. Negligible. Now the thing is Negligible. Negligible. Because it's the aggregate risk, the aggregate, aggregate exposure, we don't have data to show it exposed at all. You could say from the biomonitoring, it's only about 1% detection in the United States, if you want to be that specific. Mm -hmm. percent yeah. and at very low levels so only the detection mm -hmm. rate but also the quantity of it's it's if it's detected it's very low
Any additions? We need to draw the attention to the fact that in our thinking, the risk that we're looking at is the reproductive and developmental. We're not, there could be other effects that we're not, that we have not done literature searches for. I mean, we, you know. Well, the, I mean, there are other effects. So, um, you, whatever evaluation. You could derive OL, no AL, or a reference dose for those. Right, and, it, and from this one study, it says it's lower benchmark dose and confidence interval the, with a benchmark response of 5% is in a 19 milligrams per kilogram. So there could be, but, um, so whatever we that was right, at, right there, okay. top of the page. Authors of, oh, salient. My point is that the risk evaluation comments are going to be based, our comments are going to be based on re reproductive and developmental, not on yeah. general. Uh, point of departure, reference dose. Lower benchmark dose, point of departure. Risk is minimum. Okay. But that was only for the. That was for the. Um, skeletal. Skeletal variations. variations. I doesn't say. <clears throat> thyroid effects. Fifty-eight was the estimate. The nineteen is the lower confidence interval. So, I mean, in terms of reproductive effects, there there seems to be very little concern. But our focus has been just, you know, we haven't really considered those kind of skeletal. So that's the point I was trying to make. There may be something other than what we're focusing on. We're not trying to be. I would, Mike, what I would do is leave that last sentence in there, but uh, at the end have, however, uh, no uh, point of departure in this could, could be determined in this study for the anti-androgenic effects.
to a recommendation. Andreas? Yeah, this, <clears throat> this picture that is before us, uh, um, would suggest that it's totally opaque why, why this compound error was suggested for an intermediate ban or an interim ban. Recommend delisting for intermediate ban. On the one hand, it would be justified to recommend uh, lifting this. Yeah. On the the only the only thing that is slightly worrying, in my opinion, is this primary um, rib effect. The alter uh, either lifting the ban or uh, to say let us. It could be left intermediate pending further clarification of that rib effect. I think that's a good way to do it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like that's that. reasonable. I think that's reasonable. There. Recommendation is to lift. No, lift. I thought we just said maintain the ban no. pending <clears throat> further evaluation of the. Yeah, yeah, until, you know, maintain the intermediate ban until the rib effect is clarified and then decide again. You mean either confirmed or not confirmed? In another yeah, study the, the by decision clarifying. then will be either either continuation of a ban or or a lifting in my opinion i'm not sure well i'm not sure can you say with your hand on your heart what what is this supernumerary rib i was going to ask that question what with phil yeah yeah that's that those are effects that are that are often seen in these kinds of studies um, and it, it's, it's often hard to know what to make of them. Um, what do they mean? Um, I, I guess the only hesitation I have here is that we only have this one study. I just can't see how we can maintain a band. Or well, you're not you're not talking about major. You're about something that you see in, in, in quite a few different types of studies, right? I mean, you're seeing this in other types of studies. This, oh yeah, this is not uncommon. This is not uncommon. What is it indicative of? And what is does it a, mean? What is a it, birth is defect? It, is this a is it what a problem is, or not? Is it a problem in what sense for the rat? Well, it's no, a developmental. It's a developmental hmm. risk for a human being. I, you never. I don't think you ever see this in humans. Supernumerary ribs. Is that what you're asking? No. Well, that, that, then that's. But it, it could be of relevance. You know, in terms of indicative of a developmental process gone awry. I, I don't know. I don't know yeah. very much about the implications of. Yeah, what I don't. I don't know the answer. I, to that. I think it's one of those that people debate whether it's basis for a. a assessment in human health, like whether it would meet the level of a, a probable toxic yep. rather than a possible. And I can't see this being a reason for maintaining a ban. It certainly is not part of the late syndrome. It's not. That's to me, right. To me, it's not a powerful argument at all for maintaining a ban. Well, if, if this is so, then that points need to need to need a little elaboration, really. All right. If somebody can put but that other in. than that, I would then also be prepared to go along with uh, with lifting that intermediate ban. Well, I have a follow-up question there for Phil. You you said this is one study that this has been seen in, right? So for this, right? Chemical. So yeah. are you comfortable then, given that it's one study, um, that the anti-androgenic effects are really not there? I mean, is one study enough to say 
that it's negative for I'm just kind of flipping it around yeah um, well of course one would always like to have things replicated right um, if there were two studies that showed it I'd be much more comfortable saying because in this case it's kind of the opposite of sometimes where you have one study that shows mm -hmm. an association you say well we'd like to see it replicated but it's one study maybe it means something in this case it's one study that did not show it's one negative study. Yeah. Is, is that sufficient to then yeah. cha change its listing? I'm just asking in terms of, I, I don't know how well done the study was and the timing, et cetera. Is it enough? Yeah, to, I mean, I think it's a well done. I think, yeah, uh, yeah well I think done. the numbers and multiple doses, um, good study. I think we went through this the last time. We talked about this study. Well, it's, it's what we have. Yeah. Well, can I suggest then that we, we, at this point, recommend lifting of that intermediate ban, but the, I mean, we can't do this now, but the, this rib effect uh, needs to be elaborated why this is of sufficiently low importance for right. us to motivate that decision, I recommendation agree. rather. This is from Calculated for. Uh, Can you make it bigger, please? Uh, the eye of a milligram per kilogram per mm -hmm. day. No. More like a microgram. Yeah. Order of magnitude. No, three orders of magnitude. Yeah. Service of magnitude. Sorry. So they clearly dismiss the, the rib effects as well, being. Well, I, I think the rib effect w w came later, but oh. I think the, the rib effect would. The ADI wouldn't even be that low, probably, or no lower than this anyway. Well, I agree with Andreas. I think put lift the van, but we do have to put a statement in about the rib effect so that we cover ourselves in indicating, as you say, that it is this common and it's an animal type of effect and not seen in humans. I yeah. think that's more an appropriate way of solving that question. But what about the liver and thyroid? It's, we're not. Limiting ourselves to developmental endpoints. Which I'm kind of flipping it around in my head. It seems to me that would be maybe reason not to place a ban, but does, do we have evidence of really that we want to lift a ban? evidence of toxicity other than what we're looking at? Well, there's, there's, I mean, there's toxicity, there usually is, but what's the toxicity relative to the exposure? Question, um, since if it's not antiandrogenic, then you're not worried about the you know cumulative effects with other phthalates, mm -hmm. so it, it simplifies. I mean, it, it simplifies things. Um, prudent to look at the another endpoint. Absence of uh, androgenicity. Said the ADI was pretty high. 
Well, one, one maybe. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty high. I mean, and that's. Actually, the way was what it OD is 20 makes it, but the divide that by 100, it would still be 0 0.2. <coughs> That's still probably more than the exposure. After well, 100. the current exposure, current if you put it in the toys, we have no idea. Well, are we, we going to complete this, or? I just say lift it at this particular point in time. Want to there, the, in three weight of evidence, A, experimental design, the last line says the recently published Salonfet study was of appropriate design to have confidence in observed toxicological effects. I know this was written a while ago, but can you? Interpret that for me, or, or what? What's meant by? I don't. That probably was. I didn't write that. <laughs> um. Well, I I think it's just saying it's a well Pro study. appropriately done study. Confidence and observe. So it's saying there's observed toxicological effects, or I mean, I would have thought it would have said something like. It was well designed, and have confidence in seeing no observed, you know, apart from the rib toxicological effects. At least in relation to antiandrogenic. I think it was mis misstated. Yeah, it, it, it's in the, in, in, the re in the observations or the results. Results that there were no. What did the oil system cells make of those ribs? One no. Sorry. What did the oil? What did the oil system cells make of those rib observations? I don't remember. I'd have to go back and look at the paper. But I. Uh, can I suggest we leave it there for the time being with the proviso that the papers checked and um, the relevance or otherwise of these observations are discussed? Yeah, I, I will. I will look into this and and then uh, have Mike complete this based on what I find, and then I'll submit it to all of you for uh, for review. Okay. Where are we leaning? Topic. Well, I think if 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 come down and decide that the, the the rib effect is is really a minor effect, which is what I think it will be, then I think we're leaning more toward lifting it. We need to put that in context to what we've been talking about, though. Relative to the other endpoints that aren't part of what we're looking at. Uh, let me, you know, write something, Chris, and then um, send it around and all of you can make comments and we'll come up with a final version that we Sounds all agree good. upon. Okay, so we'll move on from uh, DNOP to DINP. Actually, 
All right, DEHP. Well, DHP again, I'd, I'd suggest a copy and paste job from either DBP or BBP with the same recommendations in the direction of the other U.S. competent authorities. You have to have a wrist part, you know. Copy that. Oh. The 99th mile of the uh, margin of exposure I calculate here, 22 to 36. That's for the in that's for the infants. Yes. Similar for um, pregnant pregnant women, twenty three to thirty nine.
in contrast to other materials, it's still found in children's toys, up to a level of 12 percent. That was one of in infants, I believe it was 12 percent. When you say still found. I mean is found. But that's based on, is that based on older data? That's not. Stuff is still out there. Well, it shouldn't be. I mean, that's based on data assuming that it's in toys. Mm-hmm. Well, it's also HP. I mean, do you want to say something about the relative contribution of DEHP to the total? Burden, the total risk. But I would at least uh, change the 4C part to distinguish it from dibutyl stellate and the others. And I would say here the margins of exposure for total DHP exposure are too small or insufficient to distinguish it from, from dibutyl stellate. To right. Still haven't said anything about the cumulative risk. It drives the the uh, hazard index analysis. But, but we have we haven't referred to that uh, for any of the other substances. No, but I think that's part of the charge. Oh. I mean, it's in the report, but I think to yeah. dr to point it out here would be important that it's it drives the. The hazard index analysis to where estimates of perhaps 10 percent of pregnant women in the United States have hazard indexes greater than one, largely based on DEHP. Don't we say that? So now that's based on 2005 and well, six data, but. Um, It dominates the hazard index analysis. Is that what you're after? Pregnant women. <coughs> right there. I think the verb is not right. Estimates that about 10% of pregnant women exceed a human. Except. And do you want to put the date on the NHANES data that we looked at? I mean, it's there, but it's 2005 and six.
Any additional comments? Hearing none, let's move on to the next phthalate. Oh, we didn't do six? Well, it's, it's, yep, because, oh, because it's already banned. Banned. No change from the last. Same wording as the last one we said with band. Oh, yeah, well, from Dave. Okay. Hey. The IOP. We have one developmental toxicity study where the route of exposure was not appropriate. Um, we don't really have access to the data. Um, they found apparently some soft tissue abnormalities, but don't really know much about it other than that. No human studies, apparently. No reproductive studies. Has been found in teethers and pacifiers. Because of the structure of the DIOP, is it similar? Would it be similar? Could it possibly be similar to DNOP in terms of its toxicity? If not very. We should state that somewhere, Mike, that the risk or hazard, I mean.
Well, we should go to risk then, Mike. Should we be more general about the hazard? I'm reluctant to mention the HPI. I would say due to structural characteristics, we have to assume that it's within the window of the active delayed somehow, so necessarily. DHP. Not a sentence that is written yes. associated, associated with, with andrio androgenic. That's okay, but the last part. The last part. Oh, associated with. Holger, is it a, it's a mixture as well? I'm looking here at the CAS, at the CAS uh, number and uh, definitely means that it has a train, backbone train length with less, with seven carbons or less. which would put it into the window of activity. Twenty seven five fifty four dash twenty six dash three. Six. Even up there. Well, Holger, based, based on what you, you said, and I think what Mike said, it, instead of saying may be within, it is within. I mean, it's just a small change. Is within. Certain of that.
for them we're staying that there is some risk how do we state that we would anticipate some risk but we have very little data based you know it's um, we can't quantify it and again we need to put in here something about where it's is it present and we say it is it is present in teethers and pacifiers correct well or no that's what it says here Well, that, okay. No measured values and no estimated values for exposure compound in our reports. So, so we have to say currently there is no exposure. There is no Neither exposure. Neither biomonitoring data nor aggregate exposure right. data indicates any exposure. Therefore, there is no risk. No risk. Or de minimis but look or at the, negligible. Look negligible at the exposure risk. section that's written here. Yeah. Because it's found in not in teethers. Food associated products and teethers and pacifiers. Well not, it says it has been found, yeah, but, but I don't not know per, not currently. That. It's not current. I mean, we, we, this has got to be consistent. I yeah, mean, I mean, can't not in one current. place say it's not, and the other place say it is or has been. Doesn't matter. Well, we need to reference for that. But there's no data or no support that statement. Well, that's fine. That needs to be removed. Mm -hmm. If it is, it didn't come up. I mean, then it, you should. I wouldn't simply. I would check it for the reference, at least. Because if if it once has been in there, there might be a chance that it gets in there again. Mm -hmm. But right now, nothing points that direction. Going back to C, currently there is no exposure. Right. Or, or limited. I mean, can we really say no? Negligible. Negligible. <laughs> Just like we said before. Well, for negligible information. Well, there's no data. And there's nothing. There's nothing in Haynes. There's nothing. But no in data. Any of the I think it needs to read like there's no data, not that there's no exposure. We don't know about. Well, people did these other studies and they didn't find it. It wasn't detectable. Olga, are they measuring the correct metabolite? I do not measure, or we do not measure the, the, the monoester for it. But I assume that we would see some kind of structure similarity in the chromatograms, and we don't sure. see something there. Oh. Got two is is there. We're negligible. Yeah. Either or, really.
situation when we need more data, more toxicity data. Uh, and it's unfortunate that we're in a position where we you know, have to anticipate what we would expect and not have solid data. Well, you can say the same thing from the exposure side. We don't have any data or quantifiable data. Is that the sort of thing that we would we would put in our recommendation, whatever that is, a qualifier that you, know, you need more you need more beta toxicity to, and exposure data yeah. to make a decision? Sitting in the middle of nowhere. Data are limited. These are unknown or unquantifiable. Uh, yeah, but the structure suggests that there could be a. Wouldn't this be in the hazard plot? Yeah. Well, it's it's there. <sighs> I don't think so. I. Well, I think we should go on for the recommendation and paste in the. Part we prepared for the die and hexyl phthalate. What? Let's see what it's written there, what we designed. Really, do we really say it can be permanent done? We don't have enough data. Yeah, we should, we could propose we, an interim ban. We can say an interim brand and then if we revisit it after toxicology and exposure data are acquired to reduce the large, very large uncertainties we have with this compound, period. That we that recommends that and there's an interim ban. AOP be placed on an interim ban. And ending. Well, the and that because of the lack of exposure, toxicology, and other data to assess risk. Uh, it's incumbent upon whoever is going to do this to uh, <laughs> reduce these very large uncertainties. Not adequately. It's, 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 it's not even we not even close to adequately able to assess. Period. Moving on to DINP. No. That's why. It's not being used. We don't know if it's being. We don't know anything. 
I would say yes. Because it prevents the introduction of this material into commerce until such time as well, the toxicology and exposure does, in fact, confirm or deny the reasonableness of the ban. wording for that in the Worded, no, but. No, but this is different. Yes, but. Because, because we're not sure. If, we're not sure. We don't have any information to tell us one way or the other as there, whether there is or is not, whereas in other cases, we know it's not being used. Well, I mean, we haven't seen it in the products that we tested. That, does, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. There's no data on in Haynes. There's, there's, we didn't even do a, an exposure assessment with exposure factors. Yes would mean that it would re minimize potential for any introduction until the data is sufficiently sufficient to prove or disprove the notion that it should be banned. Plus there has been the indication that it has possibly has been used in heathers and toys. Yeah, I would say yes. I think it would make I agree. A I think yes is. Yes. I, I also agree, yeah. Difference. <laughs> I, I, I'm convinced that yes is the right answer. I accidentally, oh, here we go. I actually, no, I didn't delete it. I accidentally opened the new document. There we go. Yeah, every, about every sentence. I, at lunchtime, I should have copied it to the, another drive. I think a lot of this uh, DINP stuff has to be updated because in the last couple of uh, last years, new studies came out. So this has definitely to be updated with the current state of the art. data out already. I guess so.
Can I ask a question? Is the uh, Cluel study, is that out in print now? Has that been published? No, I don't think so. Uh -huh. That's a shame. The INP is in a lot of the studies, the human studies. It's not always there, but there must be something. More recent. In Haynes, I'd say yes, but I, in terms but, of the health but effects. But not in epi studies. No. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you in a sec. And it's probably because more recently, Holger, is, is when there was certainty regarding the right metabolite to measure. So, because all of the EPI studies, you know, basically are, even if they're published 2011, it's using data from a few years ago. But I think Ann Haynes now includes, right? The, the carboxylated metabolite and the mono ester of, MIN, of DINP definitely is the wrong biomarker to capture exposure. Proper metabolite, what's the? The oxidized metabolites, secondary metabolites, so hydroxy, oxy, or carboxy metabolites. What would the abbreviations be? Just uh, um, Chris, in our study, it's the car carboxy octal, monocarboxy octal phthalate. Yeah. MCOP, Chris. COP and in Haynes. Boxy isooctal. One thing that we're using in the um, case two um, determination of reference doses. Is the is the uh, result from the Hanas et al. 2011 paper that looked at relative potencies of various chemicals and the result was that um, DINP was two times less potent than DEHP and so. So if that if, if we could say that somewhere developmental section just because we're. Put it here? No. Well, I don't know. There's a reference to one, that paper in the developmental section, but it. Yeah. Just no. The, the, the top of the screen. The top of the screen. We have to be aware that the Hanna study was not designed to derive nobles or lowels. It was a study with the focus on the relative potencies. Is it? But Chris, here we could state that. Uh, Looking at the relative potencies, Hannes found that uh, DIDP was less potent. DINP. DINP was less potent than DHP by a factor of 0.3. Yeah. In terms of testosterone reduction, what is it? Testosterone and. Yes. Two point three or two to three? Two point three, I think. Testosterone production. We have to check the exact wording. Yeah, and should, well, let's check that because yeah. it may be for gene expression as well. I'm not. I yeah. don't remember.
But I think these findings have been confirmed, and that's why it's a sad thing that Clual is not out in, in the Clual study, has it? It's less potent by a factor of three. I think it, Clual study, um, it was also mentioned that DINP is less potent than DHP by a factor of three. Yeah, I mean, it's in some of Pearl Gray's studies, I mean, I factor, uh, a factor of seven in biological or the On a risk, what's the is their products? Well, I mean, we can we have exposures, yes, for if it's in toys. For all exposures, yeah. like a lot of them, it's driven by diet. But we still have exposures from toys. And well, we can, you know, we can say what it is when it's in the toys. Yes. I mean, presumably it, today it's there's none, but it's been there in the past. Yeah, and we have data to estimate. Exposure from that scenario. And should we so indicate that? Yeah. Under risk? There's a percentage. Abs right now, the absolute. Oh, the, the values? Yeah. I don't have that in front of me. I have that. Okay. Oh, we'll stick in a number from now. Our biomonitoring data. Okay. 
Okay. The IMP and the SSF. Yeah. So the the uh, in the infants the upper range for um, DINP is 411, 400 to 27,000. Hmm. That's the. Yeah. Or 100 to. 7,000. They measure MCOP or MINP in SFF. You check that, yeah. Mm Sorry, it's actually 400 to 27,000, and that's because there's a wide range of uh, reference doses. So I'm using the potency estimate to what was in the court in terms of the house paper. The estimates on the, the last sentence of the exposure, Mike, mm -hmm. are not correct. You want to, I think we should get rid of the, the MOE and the exposure section and move it down to the real. Sorry, you know, right, Oops, right. Too far. That last sentence on that exposure yes, section? Yeah. I believe the estimates of the intake values, but get rid of the margin of exposure part of that. The margins of exposure for the pregnant women. Right. That's uh, 950 to 62,000. Nine hundred and fifty. Nine hundred and fifty. Sixty two thousand. In the, in the cumulative risk, I mean, it all depends on what you're considering, you know, as a sort of place you want to be. But the, the hazard quotient for DINP range of concern with in the infants, it gets up in the high in the 99th percentile to 0.25 of the hazard quotient of 0.25. I think we should use the same terminology as before for, let's say, dibutyl phthalate.
talk of, did we talk about the cumulative dibutyl? The individual thing, no. This sentence. I don't have to repeat it, just take it out. I will take it out because it's not 400. Take out the brackets, just take out the, stop, just take out the brackets, 950 to 60, 2000. The margins of exposure, that's all right, but take out the, yeah. Take out the numbers. The numbers, yeah. The numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. we've already said it. That's it. Now the recommendation. What would you say? The logic in it would be that we would uh, propose to make the interim ban a permanent ban. That sounds fair. That sounds fair in this case. Like that, I think we should always add that text about getting other evaluations, other agencies to look at this as well. Sure. That is, you don't have to do that now. That's just okay, something you just put as filler. Well, yeah. right now it's right there, so. Yeah, well, it's just there, put it there. About six. Do you use in pharmaceuticals? Ever more. Get rid of. Get rid well, of. yeah, yeah, that's. Um, Now, uh, I need to say something about and concerned about these numbers is the 
not that they're small, but that they're part of the cumulative. Yeah, um, the margins of exposure for the, are, are small considering the severity of the effects described above and, um, but it's in combination with other similarly acting chemicals. I don't understand the need for that. Why? We're banning it. It's, A is not to me more rationale. To me is will is more rationale. Well, but will. may does not necessarily mean much of anything. Doesn't support an argument. It, it, May it doesn't support an argument. We add there and that chaps. Hazard index analysis indicates that DINP will act in combination with other. Idea, I think. The chaps. Uh, what analysis? Hazard index. Hazard index. Yeah. Indicates. Act. Will act or acts. A, a no, but it's already interim band, right? So no, but yeah, no, but. Left to do two. Two, yeah, at least. Yeah, DIDP but and DPHP. That's two. That we know of. <laughs> we need a five-minute break. A lot of a lot of uh, weak backs in the room. Twenty minute break. Okay, let's continue on with DIDP. No, no developmental toxicity data during the relevant gestational period.
Can you name some? Try again. Doesn't seem to be working. No, it's not working. Is this better? Yeah. <laughs> it was the microphone, not the throat. You know. <clears throat> yeah. I, th I think it's uh, another example of a phthalate where. It is a little opaque why it ever ended up on the list of intermediate band things from the toxicological profile. And I suggest it's, a, it's an analogous case to the um, previous example, DNOP, but without the um, proviso of supernumerary ribs. Because of that, we did not. Uh, we chose to use DIDP in the hazard index approach. However, we had no underlying tox data to use. And uh, we only chose, or we chose the <coughs> point of departure for DIDP being four times higher compared to DINP because of uh, the possibility that there might be 25% of C9 components within DIDP. However, we have to say that uh, DIDP this point of departure has been derived from the INP. Do you want to start with what, what you just said? But like in analogy, is it used in? Currently, no. No, it's not used now. Um.
Well, there definitely is exposure, as the biomonitoring data indicates. Then, then I would go on, however, there is no evidence of anti-androgenic effects. There was a recently some of that was published. Uh, it's not in here, no, because it was it just came out recently. Yes, it's it's support for that. I, th I think that really adds weight to what we're saying, you know, because the, the two studies that we have here really don't bear on the issue because they weren't done at the appropriate time in gestation. The Earl Grey study was negative. Yep, mine is working. Mine is working. <laughs> now it's on. Okay, so if we if we talk about margin of exposure, which we have in the other cases, so I think we should hear, but I think it should be based on a condition that the it's a very conservative estimate for the reference dose. I, th I think we might add, um, nevertheless, we included DIDP in the acid index approach. And in the calculation of the margin of exposure. And in the calculation of the margin, exactly. Assuming the a maximum overlap of DINP with DIDP by 25%. And therefore, multiplied the for DINP by four. Does it does it be that complex? 
you, you may not need all the details. We've, I mean, we've described those details, you know, in the other sections, but I mean, it's a very conservative estimate for a reference dose. Um, Just leave it at that. It's a conservative estimate. I think that says volumes, especially for what we're trying to use it for here. So assume, just, just say, mode, uh, assuming. Using a conservative uh, approach, then you can. Mm hmm. If you want, yeah. If it's necessary. Current conservative, not conservation. So the, the margin of exposure in, in infants, when, when you're ready for that, Mike. Okay. And I'm giving you the 99th percent okay. ranges, um, 700 to 43,000. Mm -hmm. Wait, let me check this out. And it's more than 10,000 in pregnant women. So cut out the um, margin of exposure values in the top part there. They're based on old numbers. I would include the S, the, the, yeah, just the last part of that sentence. Those numbers are old, Mike. Oh, okay. Oh, you want me to take them out? Yeah. Sorry, I think the sentence you just took, I would leave the sentence you just took out at the end, in section C. Okay. But just the way it was, get rid of the range part there.
you want me to give you the range or you just want I think it's oh they're just big numbers I yeah I, pointless Say what the those MOEs mean. Oh. I, I think by saying that the uh, reference dose was so conservative, I don't I don't want to. I think we should. Yeah. I mean, we could say that Chap didn't. I don't know. Given given that this is a conservative estimate, yeah. <clears throat> the low end wasn't cons wasn't whatever. We're kind of using a thousand as our guide there, but here we're saying it's such a conservative estimate for the reference dose. I don't think it's needed. I would admit it. Fine. I think we should add something about the, um, the developmental toxicology. Because up on top we say can cause developmental effects, and I think what we should say is that although early studies indicated that DIDP can cause developmental effects, more recent studies indicate that DIDP does not cause antiandrogenic effects. Uh, no, down in the risk. I would put it to the hazard part. Well, we've had this sort of thing in the risk part before, but I don't. It doesn't matter to me. Yes.
Holger, you want to give us wording for the recommendation? I think we agree that based on the above, we propose to or recommend to lift the interim, interim ban. ban. Recommend mean six is not applicable. To get out or putting that applicable? Well, based upon our recommendation, it's not applicable. Could I said not applicable. <laughs> you can simply erase this point here. Huh? You can simply erase this point here. Yeah, take number six out. We don't need it. Period. It's a consequential comment. Oh, it's because I cut and paste. That's why. Last but not least. Quick question, Phil. So yep. apart from the anti-androgenic for DIDP, there's there's no evidence or concern. In the relevant window of exposure, that's correct. is <clears throat> for, for DPHP well, I don't think we have any exposure data all we know is that production has been increasing okay I don't mean to so but if you look back at maybe this needs to be edited but the developmental part under DIDP talks about Numbers of cervical and lumbar ribs. Mm -hmm. Yep. Growth and survival were also adversely impacted. To address that here, like we did in the other, that we're focusing on genetic effects and not. Well, that's that's why I added that sentence at the bottom of the risk. Sorry, Mike. And King of. Does conservative approach page XX, right, which is case two. If it's 25% DINP, we'd have to make sure we reconcile it with what our recommendation was for DINP, right, because 25% will be DINP. Yeah, but in the test, it's negative. IDP. How can that be if it's 25? I mean, I, I guess the, the dose is just not high enough if it does contain 25% DINP.
You see what I'm saying? If we made a recommendation for DINP and the DIDP is 25% DINP, are they? That was the conservative approach we chose to take account of the exposure for DIDP, to handle it in terms of uh, putting some sort of reference dose to it, actually not derived for DIDP, but takes account of possible traces of DINP. In that case, if you're then saying that the study here, I guess it's one of Earl Gray's studies on DIDP, even though it contains or, or comprised of 25 percent DINP, you're not seeing any antiandrogenic effect. No, the problem so is. should it then have any we, okay. we aren't reference allowed to dose use them. for antiandrogenic? Kind of not flipping it I don't think I the other way. Right? You so kind of see. Because I guess you can't really have it both ways where you assign an RFD because you're saying it's 25 percent DINP, and then now you get to DIDP. Saying the study shows that there's no antiandrogenic effect, so then you're ignoring the presence of 25 percent DINP, for which you then assigned a reference dose. Which, which we did for the cumulative approach. But I think the interpretation is correct that the contamination of DINP and DIDP was <clears throat> sufficiently low for a DINP effect not to show up in these studies. Um, I think we discussed that some time ago for practical purposes, then the question reduces to if you <coughs> um, Say, if hypothetically DIDP is now used in toys, is then the provision in the law that says no more than 0.1% DINP still safeguarded? Yeah, that's another way of saying it. Or, or if it was used and its use went up fourfold, let's say, based on the 25%. DINP, then you'll yeah. exceed that 0.1 percent. I think when we last discussed it, the question to that, uh, sorry, the answer to that question was yes. Um, so, any the contamination issue with DIDP is covered by um, making a permanent ban on DINP. If you get my. Why don't we say that here? Round and round about that that one day. <clears throat> Difficult because you know it's very different in a way than the other chemicals, and I would just want to make sure it's consistent with what we said for DINP. Because you can't use that information at one point to derive an RFD and put it in cumulative risk assessment and then 10 pages later or later in the report ignore that and say, well, this one study showed that DIDP is not antiandrogenic and you're basically assigning it in RFD of whatever, infinity or something, right? But that's what we tried to explain here. That we, we said, however, there is no evidence of anti-androgenic effect. Nevertheless, we included the IDP in the hazard index approach and calculation of the MOE. That's literally what you said. We explain it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we could go on explaining it, saying 25. No, no, I, th I agree that it's explained. But then, then you're so the lifting of the interim ban then is based on the fact that margin of exposure then is so high, regardless of the presence of the DINP? Because it's not anti-antrogenic in, in the test. But it can 
obtains DINP, which is a portion. It's not a pure chemical, which makes it difficult to. Because you're, we're saying at one point it contains a fraction that is antiandrogenic, but then the chemical itself. I said it's a conservative not. approach, and we don't know whether the, the fraction of DINP, the alkyl chain composites that from DINP, are the ones that cause the endocrine activity in DINP that are present in DIDP. Um, DINP in itself is a mixture too. And we are not sure whether those parts of DINP that are found in DIDP actually are responsible for the antiandrogenic activity of DINP. <clears throat> Taking that one more step then, if so if you're saying DINP comprises part of DIDP, and then DINP is not a pure chemical, right? And it's comprised of something else, which may then be accounting for the anti-androgenicity of DINP. Then our conclusion on DINP and DIDP should be consistent because we're concluding on DINP, and you're saying maybe it's not really the DINP, but it's a um, a minor component of it, right? That's yeah, that, that, is, that is one decision we might have to take. We can still take out the DIDP from the cumulative hazard index approach. That, that's the other choice. Mike, can you put a split screen up and, and have the DINP uh, part C up above so we can see what that says? But do you agree, you know, in terms of reconciling, yeah, how we're. I think the point is we were just conservative in the way we handled it in the um, cumulative analysis. But looking at DIDP by itself, Maybe a dose problem that we haven't looked high enough. But in the doses, in the studies that have been done, we don't see an effect. The recommendation for DINP just down a little bit. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're saying DINP by itself is bad, but DINP as part of DIDP right. is yeah. okay. Yeah. But we that, that was the. That we haven't the, seen. It may be a dose the, effect. The faulty problem. logic, I think. Well, it's, it's like saying, you know, apples are poisonous. Here's a bushel of pears, and there's two apples in it. Is the. Is is it, you know, basically harmless or because of? So the concern about DIDP is that there could be a part in it that could be hazardous. We have not seen evidence of that. We've seen no antiandrogenic effect. Um, and the DINP is going to be limited because of the ban on DI. You know, the DINP part of DIDP will be limited because of the ban on DINP. But, but can I just point out that it is not, well, you can only regulate specific chemical entities in this way. We, we are talking about the IDP. That there is a contamination with the INP, that is clear, but. They got to get rid of it. Or keep it below a minimum that, that, That's level. the dilemma. There's no other way of dealing yeah. with it. You make a statement about the IDP. 
then they have to clean it up. The IDP just doesn't seem consistent. I mean, I, 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 I agree, but I think a, a, a way of maybe putting that in well, for the DIDP. You know, there could be a, there could be an, an antagonistic <coughs> effect between DIDP and DINP, and so therefore there's no demonstrated toxicological effects. You don't know whether or not it's just an additive. It could be a, could be canceling out the DINP. I mean, you have no idea what's going on in the chemistry. You're assuming this is just linear addi additivity, and it's obvious in the toxicology it's not. Looking at it really from like a straight logic point, you know, if you say A is toxic and B contains A within it, and B is not toxic, that's illogical. But that's assuming it's the dose. It's that's not. It's okay, not then, the then we should the say dose. that. It's, it's, but it's not, also, not only the dose, it's whether or not there's some kind of, you know, antagonism between the two chemicals that reduces the possibility of an effect. Because of the dose, it's a minor fraction and that study. How about this? It could, be, it could be anything. The point is that it's not demonstrating any toxicity in a DIDP study. And do we know that the, the DIDP that was used in a developmental talk study had DINP in it? We don't know that, do we? If others feel this is, are comfortable with this, then I, I would go along with it. I just wanted to Well, it's, point it, out. all the tests are done on the commercial product, which is a range of isomers, and it overlaps with okay. DINP. Okay. All right. I think, Russ, your, your point is well taken, and, and I share your concerns, but do you, what are you proposing as a way of dealing with that? You want them to scrub the DINP out before they use it? Russ, I think well, that's, that's reasonable. That, to consider. that would have to, I mean, based on what was said before, that I think, Andreas, you were, you were saying that, that if they if DIDP is used mm -hmm. and it contributes then to greater than 0.1 percent DINP in that product, then and you've never really separately just added DINP, then it would exceed DINP. And they'd have to get rid of DINP. And to do that, they'd have not use it. DIDP. Or they'd have to figure out a way to scrub or the to DINP it from out the of DIDP to make sure that the product is usable without exceeding the concentrations yeah, if, you would expect you for that, the INP. If the chemistry of that allows. Yes. I don't, that I don't know. So. Well, it's not, no, maybe not only the chemistry, it could be the cleanup process. I have no idea. It's all in the alcohols that are used for the production of the respective phthalates. And since there are complex mixtures of isomers, like for DINP, we don't know which are the active isomers. It might be the case that the overlap or the overlapping isomers are not the active ones. So that the center of activity is, let's say, All further right. to the left. Sure. So that is the conservative approach as we say there's the overlap and we assume that the active isomers are overlapping. That's the worst case assumption. But it might be and it probably is the case that the the activity is more to the short chain parts, to the short chain isomers. So should we put a line somewhere, or maybe I don't know. The next is the recommendation, or put it, you know, mention this somewhere else in the report. This. I mean, when when I researched the the way these these bans were <clears throat> justified in Europe in the European Union, I uh, it's really very difficult to get anywhere with this because. Uh, in no way is it coherently properly justified. But Holger, do you know? Do you know the the background? Was the motivation for banning this in Europe the contamination with the INP, or there must be a reason? No, no. Or.
asterisk or, or something, you know, say, however, the chap um, recognizes or, or points out that DINP is a minor contaminant of IDP or, or some way of qualifying that. Assuming so, that the DIDP product is um, minimizes the amount of DINP contamination, would yeah. that be helpful? Yeah. All right, I, I could accept that without any difficulty. But from a chemical perspective, it would have to be expressed much more complicated. I know, but, you know, we have a short... But it's not that easy to express. I, I know that. Would you like it to say? You just said it. Yeah. Say it again. <laughs> it needs to be more specific, or, or you, you don't think it's worth um, qualifying. Product that had DIDP in it. Can you figure out how much DINP is in that product? I'm sure they can. You can only look at the, the alcohol spectrum. Probably figure it out. I just say minimize the amount of contamination with DINP and leave it at that. Hard to come up with wording that just doesn't get either too convoluted or too so specific that it yeah. difficult to. Okay, so under under hazard that the the chap is aware that there's some overlap between IDP IDP and DINP and what that you well, mean? And, and and that the DINP in DIDP could pose a risk or a hazard. Well, I'd say that it should be minimized so it doesn't pose a risk or hazard. Well, no, I mean just in the in B in the hazard part. Oh, in the hazard. Yes, it could pose. Okay, I'll leave yeah, it that, there. Yeah, that sounds good. That's right fine. <clears throat> That's fine. So the chap is aware. Yeah. Hmm? Okay. That preparations of DIDP contain. You're, you're better at. There's a certain o a certain overlap between DINP and DIDP. What are you trying to say now? What does that mean? I don't understand at that point. There's a certain Hold overlap it. between isomers. That is, DIDP contains or a small percent or comprised of or no they can't say that 
change. Well, well. Can you not say, say it straight as it is, the IDP is contaminated with the INP? And? Yeah. yeah. Right. The Period. chap is aware that yes. the IDP is normally contaminated with the INP. Not a com it's, it's not a contamination, it's a, it's, it's a intrinsic property of the product. Or contains, also contains. Contains. Yeah. Contains some DINP. Period. Okay. Some DINP which may pose a hazard. Right. Yeah. And it's up to others to get rid of hazard if they want to use it. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Patient. <clears throat> To address the fact that this we recognize that we would expect that the uh, ban on DINP would limit overlap. They're actually now saying kind of in the, the other way because if DINP is banned to less than 0.1 percent and it's I don't know chemically not possible to make a DIDP that's less than 1 percent DINP. Then it can't be used. Then it can't be used, yeah. right? I mean, kind of, that's what you're saying from that perspective. <coughs> I only yeah. got to 0.4 percent. <laughs> I just think leave the recommendation as it is, and I yeah. think I think that it's I clear. Complicate it. It's clear that if you're going to use it, you got to get rid of the hazard. <clears throat> All right. So moving on to DPHP. Yeah, I think we all are. Is there something in this room? Well, is there a phthalate in this room? <coughs> I'm losing my voice. I think it's the, the lack of ventilation, maybe. <coughs> I, th I think Andreas brought something across the pond, I think is what it is. So is that it? Mm -hmm. Across the pond. It's wine. Okay. <laughs> I'll take that for the hour of the day. <clears throat> the right windows in the study for development. Yeah, um, the two thousand three spans the relevant window. The, the two thousand six does not.
And I, these are both studies. I don't know. We don't have details of those, right? I don't think so. Just the summaries. Summaries. Uh, the dilated renal pelvis w was a common effect in with some of the other phthalates. The INP in particular. I remember Earl having used it in his studies, did he? Well, I, I know it was in the, er, the early studies, I don't know about his, but it, it did show up in, in the early studies when they were not in the right window to see antiandrogen. Bill saw that. We don't have any exposure information at all either. There, I don't think it was very much. But it says it's in use up to 18 percent. Currently, with the biomonitoring data, we cannot distinguish between DIDP and DPHP because, strictly speaking, it's also a C10, a C. Oh. C10 phthalate. All right. So it's DPHP is something like a less isomeric DIDP. This one, we're, we're basically completely in the dark. Totally lost. So how do we do? Punt? Or say, we can't make a recommendation, but there's no reason to believe that we can say it can be used because there's no data. I mean, there was it in Earl Gray's study? What I asked you, I think yeah, it was yeah. in Earl's I don't study, have, and he mentioned that it that. was inactive, but it's not in Earl's multi-dose study. But it's it was only the presentation he gave us, I think, uh, four meetings ago. So it hasn't been published? It has well, no, been I think published? it was just published. It was? Was it, was it Hannes, the first author? I don't remember them doing DPHP. It, it might not be in the paper. He did it, but... Uh... <clears throat> well, that doesn't help us, does it? Well, uh, unless he... He did DPEP. <laughs> yep. But is that... Is that... Pental. Okay. I don't ever remember doing or publishing DPHP. Okay. But I'll check again. No, it's not. It, it, I have the paper. It's not in here. Structure-wise, is there any concern? Based, I mean, is it in a? Well, it's to substitute it. It's it's like the uh, 
EHP except instead of ethyl, it's propyl. Propyl. So you might have, I would have thought it would have been positive in his assay, but it wasn't. And, and the hexyl is the propyl. Uh, the, it's propyl. Ethyl is the propyl and the hexyl it, is the heptyl. Or it's ethyl heptyl. heptyl. <laughs> no, it's di, it's propyl heptyl. Okay. Hmm. It's one carbon added at Five each and branch. Seven, yeah, yeah, okay. Would have thought it would have been positive in whose assay? Uh, well, uh, in, at least in Earl Gray's and assay, because of the two, the branching at the two position. But we don't know that he. Well, we think he tested it, but it's not in the publication yet. Talk to us about it when he was I, here. I think he, think he did. I mean, do I, we have I can dig, those I can slides? I get the slides. Yeah. We, we didn't see it in any children's toys. No, it wasn't. But could it be used? I think it, it could be. The manufacturer says it's not intended for that use, but that doesn't mean someone wouldn't do it. try to use it. What's it inten it's intended oh. use? Uh, um, they said, uh, the manufacturer says it's not they're not marketing it for use in toys, and we haven't seen it. But, oh, but what are they marketing for use in? I think that's a whole Can, well, can we go down to, to risk and, and start putting that in? Yeah, let me get rid of this. Um, DPHP was not in his first talk. Mm -hmm. uh, it may have come up later, or maybe it was... So it's, it's not found in children's toys and personal care products, correct, currently? Yeah, not that we're aware of. By monitoring approach, DPHP is currently not distinguishable from the IDP. Or is captured together with the IDP closure. I like the first part. 
can't be distinguished. Currently, currently. I don't know, is there, isn't this a case for no action or something? Yeah. yeah. But I think we should point out, I mean, if this is true, the, the description above that, that the use of it is increasing in the marketplace, exposure is going to be going up without a whole lot of strong information about the toxicity. So I, I would hope we could recommend, you know, appropriate studies be done. Well, we should put that under risk then. That if use is, if we know a use is going up, we should so indicate that under risk. And we should say that we need toxicological studies and we need actual human exposure studies and also studies of what the sources would be. We are living in the dark. Under recommendations, would we want to say that although we cannot recommend any specific actions at this time, we do caution, urge caution, recommend that you know further studies, blah blah blah. Yeah, but all we can do. I would say, given the, the the general lack of information, uh, CHAP is unable to make a recommendation at this time. However, what's the however? We have to be That's what we're going to do now. That's the way I would phrase it. Or a chap highly or 
encourages the appropriate agencies to generate necessary toxicological and exposure data to assess the risk DPHP I mean, yes. to be clear, some of the data exists, but it's not public. <laughs> and, and also, the, I mean, the agencies would argue as to whether it's the agencies who should do the work or, or the manufacturer. Well, agencies could be either. Right. right. It's not our responsibility. It just has to be done. to obtain the necessary because that doesn't yeah. put the burden on them to generate right. good so point. They can. And in the first line would I mean it's just a really small point but the the chap does not recommend any action would it be the chap is unable to or um, that's good Unable. I qualify uh, lack of information or publicly available. Publicly available. Say toxicological information, or, or I mean, I want to just leave it general. 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 Mm -hmm. Agree. Just one L in public line. Yeah. <clears throat> it really is. Yeah. document back and look at DN finished DNOP that was the one that I was going to oh, okay do, okay do some research on the paper yeah but after having looked at all these standards maybe we make a short brainstorming whether we captured all of the relevant standards because after I had a look at uh, Gray's publication there's the ISO heptal phthalate, and which is not covered in our approach. So we might discuss whether we should include diiso heptal phthalate also in the approach, because as Earl shown in his publication, it's clearly active. Sure. So can, oh, can you Would start? There, are there any others besides that? It's, it's just that came to my mind when I read the the Hannah's publication because uh, the isoheptal phthalate is one of the ones he tested. But can't put that together for us as well for tomorrow. So heptal can't be much there. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Here. Oh, sorry. I was just saying the last line under recommendation. Yeah.
Okay. So, let's see. Now, I did send, uh, Kent did do the substitutes, the same exercise on the substitutes. It was a separate document, and I overlooked it. Um, so we have that for either the rest of today or tomorrow. Um, basically, it says there's no information for the most part. There are some studies, but there's... To do it. Did you email, email it to us? Yeah. I, I just did. emailed it. He did. I looked it over. Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot. There's a dearth of information. I thought I had seen that. Mm -hmm. It's been about 340. Well, Andreas, would you like to talk about the, to brainstorm the risk assessment section briefly before we break for the day? Something you said you would be willing to take on as a writing assignment. Want to get some input from the chap? Well, um, <clears throat> I believe this section should uh, very shortly and briefly uh, detail the approach which we used to assess all the salads which we've just done and which, which ended in recommendations. So it's, it's about uh, data quality, et cetera, et cetera, the, the philosophy which we've used, why margins of exposure, all this. So you, you're prepared to write that without any input from us? No, please um, give me some input, but whether well, you agree with this general. I think it's, uh, you're going to do a framework, literally. Basically, you're going to say what the exposure information is, what the hazard information is, and whether any sources, just the way we laid it out in the risk assessment, that would be fine. Because at least you'll point the way to each one of the recommendations having that section. It shouldn't take you very many, maybe one or two paragraphs. Send me tonight on your draft and I'll look at it. Or tomorrow morning. Or tomorrow mid morning. Eight thirty. By eight thirty. Okay. Is that okay? We'll discuss it over a beer. <laughs> I'm just having a look at our uh, contents. Where would that go? I can't find it at the moment. Yeah. Well, Chap short report. Yeah. Um, then tab, tab three. three. Oh, number three. Okay, page fifty-three. Okay. No, I did get a Earl did test DPHP at seven hundred fifty mg per kg day. Uh, it did not do anything. Uh, there were no anti-androgenic effects. Um, he says he published, this is in a poster, uh, an SOT poster for March. So we can, I guess we can cite that or, you know. Do you remember correctly that he presented some of the data here? Yeah, yeah, he did present it. Who, who did that? Earl, Earl Gray. Gray. Who's the first author on the poster, do you see? Um, I'll look it up. And that was the March SOT? Can you send that to me? I, I forwarded the message, and I'm okay. looking for the... Oh, 
define the abstract. Where are we now? Well, um, I'd like to spend then some time on uh, 4A, variability and uncertainty. You've already submitted a section and let's go around and see if we can get some input from others. I'll probably upgrade it a little bit. Bill, I'll probably upgrade it a little bit before it's all over. But sure. Let's yeah. get the guts of it. Yeah. Can I just get a bit more orientation of what the... Perhaps of this is um, just a, a brief critical discussion of uncertainties um, in the data which we discussed in section number Roman two. Or why? What's the intention? I'm sorry. What are you asking? Uh, we are discussing on your suggestion the point Roman four discussion point A variability and uncertainty. Yes. Yes. Okay. What what is the purpose of that? Do you want to have a brief discussion of uh, uncertainties in all the data listed under Roman two background and strategy, and then A B C D da 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 da? Or just give me orientation. What's the purpose of this section? I think. And then variability. Variability of what? Precisely. I think it's uncertainty in terms of the data that we used primarily to do the hazard and then the risk assessment for our recommendations. You're not, you're not going to go back to the individual studies and look at the uncertainties in those studies. I don't think that's no, no, reasonable. No. And then because what you're doing is saying, you know, how much data was there, how how much it's basically coming up with a level of confidence knowing that there's a certain amount of uns, uncertainty in one the lack of numbers two some of the types of experiments were done three the gaps in experiments have done no that were not done those are your uncertain those leave your uncertainty the variability is the between study variation in the levels of outcomes that you saw or yes, but for a lot, particular of, a lot of that is again summarized under Roman four recommendations. Roman four recommendations. Oh, Where is what that? we just discussed today. Maybe the variability, but not the uncertainty. General statements of uncertainty. Like each one of those phthalates have a have much. We, as we've shown, some of the phthalates have more data, some have less data, and some have none data, no data. Based upon those levels of uncertainty, our recommendations can be ban, interim ban, remove ban, or we have insufficient data to do anything. Those kinds of sources of uncertainty, I think, are essential somewhere in the document before you get the recommendations so that people understand why you got to where you got. Well, I agree with with I agree that this these are topics to be addressed. But what I have difficulty with is <clears throat> to address it as a separate point. I mean, we are we're constantly discussing this and reiterating when looking at at very concrete data about specific phthalates. But why should it be pulled out or other? I don't see the point for that unless there are global overarching issues. I no. think it's the global, the global issues. Yeah, but which are they precisely? Apart from not previously mentioned. Yeah. Right. So I, I. But you're, really you're saying we may not need that section 
Yeah, I don't all. see what what the purpose is. Well, think of it this way: you're 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 going to be talking about them in chapter six. I mean, in way way down the road in terms of the actual recommendation you make. This is before we make those recommendations, saying this is what you have the, to be. You, you have to be aware of this before we get there, so that you're not questioning why certain things went the way they did. But the, but the recommendations chapter starts with a criteria. Right. That, that, that makes sense to me, and obviously, first you have to develop criteria for your recommendations, and in doing so, you have to deal with certain, uh, with uncertainties, data variability, missing data. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be better to deal with it then, instead of having it, well, the effect would be actually the same, because the sequence would be... Yeah. I mean, we have that, the way it had worked in the exposure section is the same way. In, for Bursar had its uncertainties, so does CPSC. I molded them both together and said, you know, this, when you start looking at this in total for when you want to make your recommendations, or make our recommendations, you have to understand there's a certain general level of uncertainty that we have inherent in this data because not all compounds are equal, not all sources of data are equal, and all these things will lead to us to have to make expert judgment in the way we address the final recommendation. And I think that's all you're looking for. Would, yes, I, I agree with everything, but wouldn't it be better to embellish point Roman 5 recommendations A criteria? I think it would read better. I mean, put Instead all the uncertainty. Put all the uncertainty information there. Yeah, why not? Yeah, my my sense of what was going to go there would be for for Paul to write a paragraph or two about the uncertainties and variabilities that go into doing scenario based of aggregate approach to exposures. Holger would do the same for biomonitoring. You know, what are the uncertainties and, and variabilities there? And and Chris do the same thing for the hazard index approach. You know, what are the uncertainties and variabilities that, that go into that? Those were, I think, the three main sections that I envisioned that would go into that. Now, where it goes in terms of whether it's 4A or part of 5A, Matters. Well, Mike, you had to say something. Yeah, uh, um, five. Well, five is the recommendations. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think the recommendations are just you know summarize what's in section four, sections three and four. So, yeah, I mean the. The basic information should probably go in for a um. maybe maybe what it grates with me a little to call this discussion. Maybe it could be called something else, and then it would make more sense to me. Can you can you put up on the screen um, <coughs> section five A criteria to see whether. Andreas's suggestion of, of expanding that to put in this information would make sense. I'm not sure it would. No, I see it wouldn't fit very well. 
Okay, it has to be in a previous, in a section before that, but maybe uh, we should reflect not calling it discussion, but something else that reflects better the content. But I'll think about it. So I would need input from Holger and Chris for that. And Paul. Okay. Yeah, and Paul's already written. Okay. I've written a brief section, part of section but yep. yeah. I'll be more than happy to yeah. work with you to make it fit and yours fit. Fair enough. Okay. Holger, you um, something short and brief and sweet about <laughs> the uncertainties in biomonitoring. And, and that Chris, include, yeah. and that would include the issues of spot urine samples versus 24 versus repeats versus single numbers, those are where your uncertainties will be derived from, largely. Not the analytic methods, since they're in pretty good shape. It's the strategy for sampling. Yeah. Then the next point under this section is B, species differences in metabolism, sensitivity, mechanism, etc. And I'm supposed to write something. I think I started. Again, wouldn't it be better to move this into section Roman 2? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was there, and, and I think, <laughs> based on your urging, we moved it out of there. <laughs> I remember last time during the teleconference, I suggested to put it into 2. Oh, okay. So we could, would it make sense to put it right after 2B? Okay. And then the, the final part of that is the missing data. And I'm I'm not sure what will what what should go in there. Other than to say there lots of missing lots data. Lots of missing data. I mean that's a fair thing to say because how how can Congress in a in any kind with any kind of wisdom request us to do a a comprehensive cumulative risk assessment without the data. I mean, it is it's somewhat ludicrous. I mean, they assume the data exists, but the, the funds are not made available to EPA, CPSC, or any other agency, FDA, to, to collect the data needed either in biomonitoring, exposure data, and in some cases, it appears toxicology, to make a comprehensive assessment. So I think that's a very critical failure in terms of how we have to, in a sense, backfill with our best guess for something that's so important. Sounds like you'd like to write that section. I guess I'll write it. Thank you. I should have kept my mouth shut. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to do it, Phil. No, I, I, I think having a standalone section that that yes. Does what you say is is important. Right. I mean, I think we've said that all along in the recommendations mm -hmm. that you know the appropriate agencies need to. Want to change it from missing data to future needs or you know some other type of because it sounds like what Paul was saying is more of a perspective mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the the field or decision making, right, Paul, rather than a specific. Right. piece of missing data. Yeah. yeah. It's more of a, a it's view. Not as, it's yeah, not as if vision. we had yeah. one piece of data, we'd be able to solve all our problems. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Rather than saying we need one more tox study, that you know, more mm -hmm. an right. study, more, you know, whatever it may be. It's I think Byrne envisioned that it would be a short section when well, uh, this will be a short statement. Sure. This is maybe a paragraph. Yeah, it could be a paragraph. And it, it could even be blended in with the um, uncertainty. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. 
Does it contribute tremendous source of uncertainties are, are data mm -hmm. gaps? Yeah, it could be. Can we briefly reflect on the timeline here? I mean, these are now uh, because of Bernie's illness, um, additional writing assignments, and I'm aware that originally the deadline to for all this to go out to peer review is first of March. Is it okay to delay this by one week? Or not? I think it's okay to delay a week or maybe more. Um, I think it would just, what I am told is that uh, a, a brief request from the, from the chair, from the chairman, uh, you know, saying we need ex so much extra time because. I think, I think what we, we should do, um, perhaps at dinner this evening, is to talk about how much time we need, look at our calendars as we go out. All right, so then tomorrow we will. Well, you wait, yeah, you wanted to start a little bit early tomorrow, 8.30? Yes. 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 We will look at the uh, phthalate substitutes. Yes. With Russ and I will be leaving here at 11.30. Right. So we've got six. Should be able to do that in. Yeah, and I think they'll be uh, shorter. Yeah. And several of them. I don't know the if they'll be easier, but they'll be shorter. Well, when we, once we do one, several of them should be yeah. the same format. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you for guiding us through this, Phil. You've done a great job as chair. Thank you. Superb day. All right. So we are adjourned for the day, and we shall meet again tomorrow at 8.30. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you all.